appreciate that, sharing your gifts with us. Um, I want to tell a story, and then we'll pray and get into the message. So Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev used to tell of a time where there was a wave of petty theft in the Soviet Union. So to curtail this, authorities put up guards around the factories in the area. At one timber works in Leningrad, the guard knew the workers in the factory very well. And the first evening came out Piotr Petrovich with a wheelbarrow. And on the wheelbarrow, a sack with something suspicious looking inside of it. As he approached the gate, the guard said, now stop right there. What's in the wheelbarrow? And he said, just sawdust and chips. And the guard said, no, come on, let me see it. So he dumped it out and it was just sawdust and chips. And he said, all right. So he put it all back together and he let him take it home. So this went on for a week straight. And at the end of the week, the guard was getting very frustrated. And he said, Tietor, I know you. What are you smuggling out here? Tell me tonight and I'll, I'll let you go. And he said, wheelbarrows, my friend, wheelbarrows. <laughs> are we distracted? Are we missing the plain facts, not seeing them? I want to go through a Bible passage today. Mark chapter 9, verses 14 through 29. We're going to skim, we're going to, we're going to study through this passage today to see some of the distractions of life and to see how Jesus was dealing with it. Now, you guys are probably familiar with this story to some degree. This is Mark chapter 9, 14 through 29. This is where the father of the demon-possessed boy brings his boy to the disciples. and They try to cast out the demon. Um, and Jesus is on the Mount of Transfigurations while this has started. Then he comes down. And I want to not give the whole story away, so we'll go to Mark chapter 9 and verse 14, and we'll go through this passage together and see what we can pick out of this pericope. Mark chapter 9, verse 14, the Bible says, And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him greeted him. And he asked the scribes, What are you discussing with them? So this man, as I said, brought down this demon-possessed boy to Christ's disciples to see if they could cast out. And they tried and they couldn't. And they had failed and they knew that they had failed. And as this is taking place, the scribes, not wanting to miss an opportunity to defame Jesus, started attacking the disciples and mocking them in front of the crowd and started an argument with them to distract from what's really taking place. And as all this is going on, Jesus walks down off the mountain and gets to where everybody's gathered. And this is what caught my attention. As soon as Jesus shows up, all the people are amazed. Why are they amazed that Jesus showed up there? I mean, where Jesus' disciples are, wouldn't you expect to have an encounter with Jesus? Where Jesus' people are, shouldn't you expect Jesus to be there too? Where the people are gathered together in the name of Jesus and trying to do the works of Jesus, wouldn't you expect Jesus to be there? But as Jesus walks down this mountain, the people that are gathered around are amazed that Jesus is there. On top of that, when the Jesus does come, he looks at the scribes and he says, why are you arguing with my disciples? And suddenly the scribes were once emboldened to say all that they wanted to and to stir up the crowd against the, the, the works of Christ's disciples and what they're trying to do. They suddenly become silent. They have nothing to say now. They're speechless. They don't know what to say about this situation. Brothers and sisters, here's a question I would just pose to you. When you come where the people of Jesus are gathered together, do you expect an encounter with Jesus? Do you expect to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you expect your heart to burn within you? Do you expect to hear the voice of God talk to you? Do you expect to get the direction, the counsel that you've been looking for? Do you expect to come and have a group of body, uh, uh, like-minded believers pray for you and to have that prayer answered? When you come around Jesus, do you expect that encounter or like the multitudes, are you amazed that Jesus shows up? Are you amazed that your prayer is actually heard? Are you amazed that you know, Jesus spoke to you that day, or the Holy Spirit talked to you, or you got that direction you were looking for. Let me tell you that there's a difference between coming to church looking for God's leading, looking for the voice of God to speak to you, looking for the direction that God wants to give you, looking for the prayers to be answered, and for coming here in happenstance and hoping that they will be. When you come to church, do you have a purpose for being here? Are you coming here to meet Jesus? 
The crowd grew silent because Jesus was talking to the scribes and the scribes have nothing to say. And finally, there's a voice that cries out in verse 17. Finally, we hear a voice in verse 17. Then one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. As the crowd says they're silent, the father can't handle it anymore. I don't know if any of you have been around people with seizures before. It's quite a traumatic experience the first time you see it. You can get used to it after you've been around it for a while, but I can guarantee you the first time you see someone suddenly thrust themselves to the ground and start shaking for no reason whatsoever, it catches your attention. I saw that one time. I think I shared this story before, but this could go on and tell it anyways. So I'm getting that age where I don't know if I've told the stories or not. Anyways, I was in North Idaho, and I looked out my front window from my house, and all of a sudden this little boy was riding his bicycle across the street, and out of nowhere he just falls to the ground and starts shaking. And I don't know who was shaking more, the boy or me. And I ran out, and I'm like, are you okay? Are you okay? And his mother got there before I did. And I'm like, is he okay? She's like, yeah, he's fine. I'm like, no, he's not. He's shaking on the ground. What happened? He has seizures. I'm like, okay, so what do you want me to do? Like, I went in, like, special ops mode. I'm going to do something. I'm like, you want me to call 911? She's like, no, nope, already handled. I'm like, do you want me to do anything? She's like, no, nope. he does this all the time. As soon as he stops shaking, I'm just going to pick him up, carry him aside. He'll sleep for a couple of days. I'm like, really? She's like, yeah, but it scares you, and you don't know when they're going to happen, and that's the dangerous part of them. And this boy apparently is demon-possessed, and when the demon manifests himself in this little boy, he goes into sheezers and shakes on the ground, and you don't know where it's going to happen. And he says, it doesn't matter where it's at. It can be in a fire. It can be anywhere. And you can imagine the heartache of this father who's feeling for his son, wanting him to have a better life, and he reaches out, Jesus, can't you help me? This boy needs your help. He's got seizures. There's something wrong with him. He doesn't know there's seizures, but the demon manifests himself in seizures. And Jesus looks over the crowd, and he sees the disciples' perplexities. He sees the fault-finding scribes. He sees a great lack of belief in the crowd, and he cries out in a voice of pity. Now, you might be tempted to believe that Jesus was frustrated with the people in that scene when he says, Oh, you faithless generation. But Jesus doesn't get frustrated with us so easily. Jesus understands our natures. Jesus understands our weaknesses. But instead of frustration, Jesus looks at the crowd in great pity. He feels pity for the crowd. He feels pity for the disciples. He feels pity for the fault-finding scribes. He feels pity for the Father. And most of all, he feels pity for this poor boy who is constantly harassed by the devil. Why does Jesus pity them? Now, I just want to remind you of something. This father went to the right place. He went to the disciples of Jesus looking for help. We should be thrilled when people come through those doors to our church looking for help because they're coming to Jesus. Jesus may not be here in physical form, but Jesus is here in this church. We are his hands, we are his feet, we are his body. And when people come through those doors looking for our help, we should be thrilled that God has given us the opportunity to help people in need. They're seeking for Jesus, and we should be happy to jump up and help them where they can. The disciples, they tried helping this man. They tried casting the demon out of this boy, but they couldn't do it. And Jesus looks at all this happening and he sees this scene of chaos and, and of discouragement and, and, and people feeling like failures. And he looks at them with pity and he says, oh, you faithless generation. And we're tempted to think that he was angry, but he wasn't. Jesus is pointing out to them. You are so distracted about the things of your life that you don't realize that I have something so much better for you. You don't know that I want to use you to cast out demons. 
You don't know that I want to use you to help other people. You don't know that I want to heal people in this church. You don't know that I have all these things in store for you because you're distracted by all the other things in your life that are choking your attention from me. In this case, the disciples were self-seeking. The scribes were fighting about their law and their religious way and how they knew the Bible better than anybody else. The crowd was just in awe because they were just spectators to this thing and they were just distracted in general because they didn't even know what they were there for. And Jesus looks at this crowd and he says, I have something so much better for you. But you're too busy focusing on things that don't even matter. Are you distracted? Are you distracted? You know... We get these questions all the time. We ask them all the time. Is it okay to do this on the Sabbath? Or is it okay if I watch this? Or if I do this activity? Or these things? And I just want to tell you, sometimes those questions don't come down to right or wrong. Sometimes there's no morality in them. Sometimes the decisions we make have nothing to do with whether it's right or it's wrong. Let me tell you something. There is no morality in a speed limit. If there was morale in a speed limit, it would be the same everywhere we went. Jesus tells us to respect the laws of the land and the authorities who make them, so we keep the speed limits, but it, there is no morality. God's not judging us on whether we keep the speed limit or not because it's not right and it's not wrong. It's just something that we do because that's what we've decided on. There's things in life that we may do or may not do. It has nothing to do with morality. It is not wrong to do certain activities on a Sabbath. It's not wrong to do certain activities outside of church. It's not wrong to do some of these things. But Jesus might ask us not to because he has something better for us. He might ask us not to because there's something better we could be doing to occupy our time. You see, we get so complicated in life, we want to break things down to right or wrong, and the devil says, that's perfect because there's nothing wrong with this activity. But Jesus might be saying, but it's keeping you from doing something that I want you to do more. Are we distracted? How would you know that? We'd have to talk to Jesus. He feels pity for them. Feels pity for them. Then as Satan can see something's moving, we read in verse 20, then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming, at the mouth. As soon as the boy got near Satan, started posturing and making a display. The boy immediately started into convulsions, falling to the ground and foaming at the mouth. The closer we get to the end, the closer we get to deliverance, the closer we get to Jesus and the one who can help, Satan is going to posture. Satan is going to give us trials. Satan is going to give us tribulations. Satan is going to find distractions. Satan's going to put things in our path. Satan is going to do what he can to stop what Jesus is wanting to do. In this case, he causes the boy to convulse and fall to the ground. Satan wants to scare you. He wants to discourage you. He wants to get you to doubt. He's going to point out the circumstances in your life. He's going to point out all your failings. He's going to point out your previous bad experiences with the church, all the negativity that has come to you because of the professed believers of God. And he will do all this because he knows if you have faith that God wants to do something special through you, if you have faith that God wants to heal you, if you have faith that God is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do, the devil will be defeated. So he will do everything he can to get you away from that thought and to get you away from that belief. He's going to distract you. The question is, are you distracted? The time came for Jesus to come into action. We read what he does in 21. So Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Jesus engages this father in conversation to get him to recollect his thoughts and to focus on him. Now I find it amazing that when this man is standing in front of Jesus, 
he has less faith than he did before Jesus got there. Before Jesus showed up, this man brought his son to the disciples, expecting his son to be healed. He came to where there was healing at. And when Jesus, the great healer, the master physician, shows up, this man is suddenly lacking faith. He suddenly doesn't believe that God can do what he said he can do. Now this man has seen the disciples of Christ try but fail. He's now seen Satan take control of this boy and lead him into a deeper convulsion, into a deeper expression of demoniac possession. And this father's taking all this in and it's overwhelming his senses and his faith is leaving him. It's fleeting and he says, I don't know if I believe anymore. And Jesus picks up on this and he says, if you just believe. And the father looked at Jesus with the most sincere prayer of a parent who has a struggling child and says, Jesus... I need your help to believe. Help me believe in you. Because I have it here. I can read your word. I can read the stories. It makes sense in my head. But I'm struggling to believe because I don't see it happening. Maybe you can relate to that. Jesus points this man's faith back to him. If you can believe, all things are possible. If we can believe that God can do what he says he can do, all things are possible. If we can believe that God wants us to change, all things are possible. If we can believe that Jesus will use those who he puts in positions to accomplish his purposes, all things are possible. If we can believe that God can use us to do his will, all things are possible. If we can believe that Jesus can perform miracles, all things are possible. If we can just look past the evidence that is directly in front of us and focus on what God can do, all things are possible. Jesus just told us all things are possible for those who believe. Do you believe that? The devil wants you distracted. Because he doesn't want you to believe that all things are possible. He wants you to recount your past life and see all the times you've made those commitments to God and failed. Is he still powerful enough to change you? He wants you to look at all those times. The church has let you down. Can he still use this church? He wants to look at those times. Your family's been hurt. Can he heal this family? The devil wants you to look back at your marriage and see all the times that you've been in fights over the same ground over and over again. Can he move us past this? All things are possible for those who believe. Do you believe that? Well, if you believe that, you better be sure of one thing. The devil's going to try to distract you now. Are you distracted? The father cries out, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Revive my faith in you. Get me out of this doubt that's just crept into my mind. Get me out of this spiritual funk. Revive me, Lord. Change me. I believe. Help me get there. And then Jesus decides in verse 25, it's time to accomplish something. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Jesus decides that it's time to heal the boy, and he heals him. But it didn't go the way we always expect it to. The boy falls to the ground as if dead, so much so that the crowd actually questions whether he's dead or not. But Jesus simply bends over and picks up the boy and raises him to freedom. Now, I don't know why it happens this way, but sometimes the healing that God does is instantaneous, and sometimes it's a process. And I couldn't explain to you why that is, but that's just the way it is. I have a friend. His mother always prayed. She was a Catholic. She always prayed. She was a devout Catholic. She went to church all the time. She always prayed the same prayer. She prayed that her husband would come into the church and that her two sons would come into the church. 
She said this prayer over and over and over for years and years and years. And every time those church doors were open, she would go and she would say this prayer. I pray that my husband will come into the church and that my two boys will come into the church. She only had two boys. She said this prayer over and over and over again. And then one day the Lord answered her prayer. She got hit by a bus. And she went into a coma for a week. That experience brought her husband and her two sons into the church. But when she came out of that coma, she didn't come out 100% healthy as she did before she went into that coma. When she woke up, her youngest son was the first to see it, and he said, Mom, you're awake. And she looked at him and she said, Who are you? Because what you don't see in the movies is that when you go into a coma, you don't always come out with your right cognition. You don't always come out exactly the way you were. But God did restore her eventually back to her full health. And not only did he restore her eventually back to her full health, but that experience was so monumental in that family that they all became Adventists, and two of them are pastors today. We'll wrap up the story in verses 28 and 29. And when he had come into his house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could you not cast him out? Why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. The disciples were stunned. They were shocked. They felt like failures. They didn't understand why God would give them a mission, only to allow them to fail on that mission. This man had brought this boy to them, and just days before this, Jesus had given them authority and power to cast out demons and all sorts of unclean spirits. And they went around all the area doing that, but when this man came to them, they couldn't. And they said, Jesus, how come we couldn't do it? And he said, this is only done by prayer and fasting. The reason why they couldn't cast out this demon from this boy is because none of them took time to pray. Brothers and sisters, they were so distracted. They were doing the works of God. but They weren't praying for the power to sustain the works. Are we distracted? Now, I want to tell you something. We're going to sit down this year like we do every year, and we're going to come up with a discipleship plan for this church. We're going to sit down this year like we do every year, and we're going to do evangelism. We're going to do things that we can do to help the community. We're going to do things that we can do to get our church name out there and to bring people to Jesus and to show Jesus to these people that need it. And we're not just going to shove the gospel down their throat. We're going to do health and everything else that we can think of to get this church in the community. But I'm here to tell you, no matter what good events we plan, no matter how good they are, unless we are bathing those things in prayer, it's going to accomplish very little. Are we distracted? I'm here to tell you, I'm going to stand here as your pastor, and I'm not trying to rebuke you, but I'm just going to make a very important comment here. If you think that this church can grow and accomplish the mission that God has for it in Marquette without some form of a bigger building or another building to accomplish that mission, you're sadly mistaken. It will not happen. We are stunted where we are because we need more area. We need this building to come up. We're going to have to dig deep. We're going to have to ask God to supply in ways that we haven't felt before. We might have to give until it's uncomfortable. We might have to give until we cry, and then we'll have to give until we laugh because it hurts so much. But I am telling you, this building needs to get built. Are we distracted? Now, I don't know how long there's been a building plan on the books because that happened before I became the pastor here. But I would dare to say that it's not God's fault that there's no building here. Are we distracted? God has a mission for us. He's got a purpose for us. He's looking for us to look to him and say, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. He's looking for us to pay attention to the warning signs and alarms that are buzzing all around us and say, Father, this is the year. The distractions got to go. There is stuff in our lives that we can cut out of it that will help us pay attention to the more important things in it. And you can miss out on a lot of things. But the worst thing to miss out on is eternal life. 
Shortly behind that is a relationship with Jesus that will walk you through anything that you've come through in this life. And if you neglect your family, you're missing out on one of the greater blessings that you can get. But I'm telling you right now, as a church, we are distracted. And the devil wants to keep us there. Because if he can keep us distracted, there will be people coming to our church and leaving frustrated because they couldn't get the help that they needed. Our Heavenly Father waits to bestow us upon the fullness of His blessing. It is our privilege to drink largely at the fountain of boundless love. What a wonder it is that we pray so little. God is ready and willing to hear the sincere prayer of the humblest of His children. Why should the sons and daughters of God be reluctant to pray? When prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse, where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence. There are so many blessings in prayer, and yet we do it so little. And have you ever wondered why we pray so little? Have you ever wondered why you pray so little? Let me tell you, it's right here. Satan sees the Lord's servants burdened because of the spiritual darkness that enshrouds the people. He hears their earnest prayers for divine grace and power to break the spell of indifference, carelessness, and indolence. Then with renewed zeal, he plies his arts. He tempts men to the indulgence of appetite or to some other, forth of some other form of self-gratification and thus benumbs their sensibility so that they fail to hear the very things which they most need to learn. Satan well knows that all whom he can lead to neglect prayer and the searching of scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. The reason why we pray so little is because Satan does everything he can to stop us from doing that. He's going to bring every distraction to you, to your family, in every way he can to keep you from praying. Because he knows that when a church gets united and it starts praying, God starts moving and things start happening. We've just started the new year. Maybe this would be a good time for us to go home in our prayer closets and reflect to Jesus. Lord, what distractions are in my life? What's keeping me from doing what you want me to do? What's keeping me from being what you want me to be? Maybe we should pray, Lord, remove the distractions. Father, we all have distractions in our lives. Lord, we all struggle with things, and the devil's good. He'll even make us think that we're not making a wrong choice because morally it's not wrong to do something when really he's just trying to stop us from doing something that's better. Lord, I just pray that you will grab a hold of our hearts and that you will communicate to us your direction, your will, your wisdom, and your guidance, and that you will show us the distractions in our lives. Help us, Lord, this year to remove them and pay attention to this world around us and to see that times are fastly approaching and that we don't have years and years left, Lord and that now is the time to cut the fat. I pray that you will help us in all of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 602.